Right, good morning, everyone. Hello, microphone should be on, making sure all is working. Let's say yes, so I'll go and jump straight in. So, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Crowd Simulation Crowd AI Talk. Uh, the ints, I'll jump straight in, actually, even though it's early in the morning, 9 a.m. Thanks a lot for joining me. So I'll start with the interaction, the movement, and the exchanges of large numbers of pedestrians lead to complex and beautiful movement patterns that have fascinated historians and sociologists for decades. Crowds throughout the years has been seen as a collection of individuals who adopt the behavior of the whole entity, of the whole crowd, of the whole masses of people. And a lot of historians say that individuals, when they're in a crowd, they lose their own identity and they just follow what other people are doing. However, that trend has changed over the years and uh, modern crowd studies are more looking at that crowds are groups or individual grouped together as part of a crowd and they adapt their behavior according to other group members. Also, there's been a recent trend in uh, simulation because crowd scientists and computer scientists are using recent advances in computer advancement to make environment, simulate environment crowded with countless pedestrians and everything is rendered and simulated in real time. Also using AI to make sure that those individuals are as realistic as possible. However, though, there's no real solution to make a crowd simulated as realistically as possible. And uh, there's still plenty of problems that need to be solved. So stuff I like rendering, generating animation behavior, verification and validation, etc., etc. So throughout this talk, I will introduce some fundamental features and concepts of current crowd simulation technologies. And I will often dip into psychology, into video games development. And hopefully at the end of this talk, I will help you find a new passion for the simulation of crowds with focus on AI. I haven't introduced myself. My name is Oliver Simonezic, Dr. Oliver Simonezic. I'm a lecturer in computer science at the University of Lincoln at the School of Computer Science. My background is mostly game dev stuff with focus on a lot of board games. I've got quite a lot behind, quite a few board games behind me as well. I also got a background in crowd simulation, crowd AI, and I really like maps, mapping stuff and making maps believable with thousands of individuals walking around. Also got a bit of background in wheelchair training tools using Kinect and indoor location systems. And I'm teaching mostly programming in uh, the module that I teach, uh, games programming, physics simulation. By the way, if you've got any questions, feel free to use the chat. Feel free to give me feedback. I'll try to answer where as possible. But also feel free to contact me over email. I've got my email on the last few slides, no worries. You can also find me quite easily on the University of Lincoln staff pages. All right, these are unprecedented, unprecedented times. And uh, despite the ongoing situation, there were actually countless crowd gatherings throughout 2020 and even 2021 because then i'm thinking the recent ones would be for instance yeah we've all seen those pictures of the riots in america uh we all recall the crowded beaches in the south despite the ongoing situation and uh, we all recall the toppling of statues throughout the world also in summer 2020 yeah again despite the ongoing situation it was actually a very busy years in terms of crowds However, as life, as we know, resumes, we've got a vaccine out. So actually, things are getting better and better. Large crowd are expected at many public infrastructures used for daily activities, such as shopping, commuting, traveling. And uh, those areas are bracing themselves to handle what will be most likely the busiest days ahead of post-lockdown. Because with lockdown over, people will look forward to travel again, to go to shops, to go to high street, to meet other people. It will be busy. Places will be crowded. That's for sure. However, even with a vaccine and stuff getting better, as I mentioned, the lockdown has changed our habits. Safety is first on our mind and keeping crowd movement safe is top of the mind for companies, for governments, universities, etc. 
Research shows that physical distance is critical to ensure the safety of communities. People physically separating themselves from others helps the virus to stop spreading. And therefore, there is a need to accurately monitor the movement of people and to find ways to get insights to plan, to assess risk, to implement measures. What we need are cutting edge tools, cutting edge technology to accelerate and inform decision making. So what we need is our tools to simulate crowds, to simulate the movement of people. We take an area and we simulate thousands of individuals going through that area. Then we look at ways on how to make sure that the crowds are separated, to make sure it's as safe as possible. And what we get out of this is data. It's a lot of data that we can find ways to mitigate danger and mitigate uh, problem sources. And that will help us to navigate the new normal that is ahead of us. I see there's a question of what I enjoy most about computer science. Well, at the moment, uh, at the moment, actually, I've got plenty of interest, but for this talk, it is crowd AI and making sure to simulate as many individuals as possible, as realistically as possible on the screen. That's a good question. I could easily talk for another 30 minutes, but for now, let's focus on crowd simulation. I'm very happy to have a chat with you over email as well, Blackbird11. Um, back to crowd simulation. Crowd simulation is not a new field, and uh, it's been around for more than 20 years. For instance, it's been used a lot, a lot over the last 20, 30 years, even in architecture, that you create a building and plan a building. You've got to plan ingress route, egress route, so basically escape route, people who are coming in and out, and uh, you've got to make sure everyone can leave the building as safely as possible. However, with recent advances in computer performance, um, it's easier to create large environment in real time. As I mentioned earlier, there's still challenges that are out there. However, though, if we're looking at video games, actually there's been a lot of advances in video games development and there's endless progress there. Is there anything we can learn from video games development and somehow use that in crowd simulation? Because if we're looking at video games, well, simulated crowds have played a major part of a lot of video games over the last few decades. Because if we're looking at uh, this one, FIFA 98, oof, that's over 20 years old now. And uh, what we've got are crowds in the background, even though it's just a flat sprite going up, down, up, down, and we've got the sound of sprites. Then we've got theme park where we've got crowds walking around going from one attraction to another. And it looks busy, it looks vivid. And um, over the years, we've got uh, games like Hetman where it's simulating larger crowds that behave realistically and they respond to player input as well, which is fantastic. And then even more recent games, although that's a screenshot from SimCity, an older screenshot nowadays, people are playing City Scala and much better city building game. Anyway, um, we've got plenty of crowds, plenty of vehicles going around and the city looks busy and vivid. And um, what they want to do, what people want to do in game development is making sure the environment are getting as busy and as alive as possible while keeping a high amount, a high level of realism and intelligent behavior. And uh, a lot of people say actually having crowds and having lots of people within those environment increases the fun factor. However, though very often there is a trade-off between realism and uh, realism and how many crowds there is on screen. For instance, in FIFA 98, it looks like a busy stadium with 25,000 plus crowds. But actually, as I mentioned, it's just a 2D sprite going up and down. The crowds don't really have intelligence. It looks crowded, but the crowd itself is not intelligent. Same for theme park. It's just individuals going from A to B, A to B, A to B, A to B. Same for here, even though it looks crowded, it's just based on statistical analysis. It just says, if people are unhappy, just spawn 10, 20, uh, 200, 300 people that look unhappy. Simple as that. And Hetman is a bit better though, because each individual looks realistic and uh, respond to the play realistically. I'll get back to this one later in the talk, actually. And uh, more and more games are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, for instance, we've got games like, that's a screenshot from GTA 4, 
with a couple of mods, still looks lifeless and empty. Should be buzzing with endless crowds. A lot of games though are using crowds, as I mentioned. Another good example of crowds is um, that mission in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Although that mission relied heavily on scripts to create crowds, it's been used in a couple of uh, missions. A good one is this one called uh, No Russian, where the player has to interact with simulated crowd in an airport terminal as part of a violent terrorist attack. So the main objective of the mission is to cause as much distress and havoc as possible. However, though the crowd is very realistic. So you can see individuals trying to surrender to the player, you can see individuals helping each other and the other fleeing in panic. Actually, for crowd simulation, despite it being scripted, based, despite being the same over and over again, it's actually what you would see in a real crowd as well. However, as I mentioned, it's still a very challenging task. And there's no real solution for off-the-shelf off solution for simulating crowds. As I mentioned, in Call of Duty, it's just a couple of scripts. It's just doing the same stuff over and over again. Still plenty of questions, stuff like we have to think about rendering, we have to think about generation, we have to think about behavior, we have to think about verification and validation. Stuff like rendering. Question is, how do we get as many characters on the screen? Because if we're thinking about an individual, let's say uh, one person is made out of, let's even say 5,000 polygons, and we want to have a crowd of each individual, let's say even a 1,000 people. So that's already 50,000 polygons on the screen. How does the graphical engine render as many individuals on the screen? Then the next question is, is generation. How do we generate a unique looking individuals because if you're looking at a crowd you never see the same person twice you everyone is wearing something different different clothes different hairstyle different facial legs, features physical features everyone looks different so you've got to think of a way how do i create a crowd where each individual look different so you can't just go there and say hey uh go to the poor developer and say, hey, I'd like to simulate a crowd. Can you create over a thousand unique models for each person in the crowd? And you've got to make sure that each model is animated correctly. That is um, moving slightly differently because each person in the crowd may walk differently. You have to think about a lot. So basically the poor modeler, yeah, that would have a lot of, that those people would have a lot of work. And there must be better ways. We also have to think about the AI. How do we get those numerous individuals within the crowd to behave realistically? If something is happening within the crowd in that simulation, are, is the crowd reacting accordingly? Are people walking in groups? Are people reacting to what the player does? Is it in real time as well? We have to think about the AI itself. That's a lot of work. Then there's verification and validation. After we found a way to render stuff on the screen, after we found ways to generate thousands of unique individuals, after we found a way for AI, how do we know that the crowd that we created is realistic? Is it good enough for us? Does it behave realistically to what it should do? Perhaps it looks realistic to us, but it may not look realistic if it was used in a different scenario or realistic according to what crowds should do. Because very often in video games, you see that, that it looks realistic for the player, but in real situation, the crowd would not behave that way. So there's also that fine line between believ believability and realism. It has to be believable for video games. It has to be realistic if used in a serious environment. And very often in video games and even in, in realistic simulation, there's a trade-off between, between the complexity of each individual and the size of the crowd. That you may have got a large crowd, let's suppose 25,000 individuals rendered on screen in real time, but the crowd may suffer somewhere else. So perhaps the graphics are not up to date, that each crowd is just rendered as a dot on the screen. Perhaps the crowd doesn't behave as realistically, or perhaps you've got 25,000 individuals, but about 500 of these individuals behave the same because it's just copy-pasting the individual of each other. 
So it's very often a trade-off. Do we ha want more individuals on the screen, but perhaps the intelligence is less, the rendering is less, generation is less, or do we want, yeah, we have to find a trade-off between everything. However, though, throughout the talk, it's tricky to talk about everything. I've only got still of, uh, less than uh, 30 minutes. I'm gonna focus on behavior and verification as, and validation. Like how do we get individuals within the crowd to behave realistically? And how do we know that a simulated crowd is realistic? Luckily, there's a couple of solutions out there because for behavior, we can dig into psychology and there's a lot of stuff that already exists within video games technology, stuff that has been developed for video games that we can use for crowd simulation. Same for verification and validation. There's a lot of work in robotics and AI solutions and same in uh, computer vision and video analysis that we can take over to crowd simulation. So how do we do that? Well, let's have a look at it. So let's start talking first about behavior and AI. I'm not sure how many of you live in Lincoln or has been to Lincoln. That's a screenshot, a screenshot, a real life screenshot. Well done, Oliver. That's a picture from a place in the high street where there's, there's the high street, there's a level crossing in the middle of the high street with trains going through. So the level crossing goes down and people have to wait on both sides of the tracks. People who live in Lincoln are gonna say, hey, Oliver, that's actually an old picture. Yes, it is. That picture is about four years old, but absolutely love it. Because nowadays what they've done, what they've done is uh, they built a bridge here and the uh, crowd's actually using the bridge instead. But you still see individuals left and right uh, waiting when the when the train goes past so what happens is when the barriers goes up that people start walking and that's why it gets interesting because you can see certain patterns in the crowd so if we go from a top-down level actually looking top down at the crowds we can see the generation of like rivers of flow because people within crowds they start following the person in front of them that are going within the same direction. So if they're going forward, they just follow the person in front of them. Makes sense actually. And you see that pattern as good everywhere within crowd. Christmas market throughout the world. Yeah, uh, Christmas markets throughout the world, busy environments, people within crowd just follow the person in front of them. It generates this flow. I see Blackbird, there's a question. Uh, how do I, what do you enjoy most about computer science? I answered that question earlier. Uh, Basically, what I enjoy most, just to repeat, in computer science is computer AI, uh, game dev stuff, programming, and basically everything I talk about throughout this talk is what I enjoy the most about computer science. Actually creating as many individuals on the screen as possible. Hope that helps. However, though, I'm very happy to chat with you at the end or over email. Anyway, uh, let's go back to this, That those flow movement well that, that's quite interesting and uh, psychology has looked at has looked at those pattern like the simple pattern of flow movement in crowds for quite a while and uh, one psychologist uh, called Halbing he created something called the Halbing social force model and that has roots in psychology he basically just says that uh, to, crowds are simple they just a couple of forces applied on them summed up and that creates a crowd he created a couple of mathematical equations, published it, and a couple of years later, a computer scientist decided, oh, let's take those uh, equations, let's put them onto a computer and see the results. So as I mentioned, helping social force model is simulating human behavior as a physical force. Basically, the force assumed to be the sum of several forces which correspond to the different forces simultaneously affecting the behavior of a pedestrian. Don't worry, I've got an example on the next picture to make it easier. So the idea is to find a force, to apply that force on each individual and just have a simple set of rules. And bizarrely, he said, using simple forces, simple maths, that's enough to generate the behavior of people within the crowd. So let's have a look at those forces. So basically, he says that a person within a crowd, so let's take this person, 
standing there looking very Minecraft ask Minecraft Minecraft ask this person is driven a crowd and wants to go to a particular point so basically you've got a force that of a person that drives that person towards a particular position like for instance a shop at the end of a high street so that would be a vector forward however though in the middle of the high street that person sees somebody distributing a flyer and that particular person wants to avoid that person so literally what it is it's like a vector from it's act not like it's actually a vector from the person distributing the flyer to the person that is walking towards the shop and it generates a force repulsing that person so actually this is just vector additions so it would be a vector a negative vector with the vector forward driving that person slightly to the left or right depending on the weight there's also other individuals that we want to avoid so that also affects the force perhaps you also that person it may also be attracted lightly towards the display of another shop so literally it's just a handful of vectors that you sum up together and that creates a vector where the person is going to walk and helping says that it basically just says the force acting on individual is the acceleration force basically the force driving forward towards the shop repulsive effect the attraction force towards other shop but also a person within a crowd has to look at each other individual within a crowd and avoid them because of course they don't want to bump into random people and this is just literally just a couple of factors added together as i mentioned a few times already And the result of helping social force model, somebody, somebody, it has been implemented by quite a lot of researchers throughout time. And the results look actually quite believable. Here's a crowd simulated top down. And uh, it looks realistic. Let's go, let's jump a bit more into the video where it's a bit more crowded. It does look like a real crowd. So people are trying to avoid each other, pushing through. And just a couple of addition, and it looks like a nice crowd. Actually, anybody who knows a bit more of computer science can just take helping social force model, use it in their simulation, and get realistic behavior. However, though, helping is not the golden solution for everything. Even though it looks like computer magic, as Warm says in the chat, it's still not realistic because uh, sometimes you see overlaps, people overlapping each other, which doesn't happen in real in a real crowd. People bump into each other. That's it. And uh, yeah, it's not as realistic as we could be. Let's jump to the next slide. However, though, I mentioned earlier that behavior is imposed as physical force, and that's great because there's a lot of games technology stuff out there that can do that physical stuff. Because then I'm thinking about video games, stuff like No Man's Sky, Stuns, Trespasser, or even, oh, I forgot the name, Super Smash Melee. Yeah, video games, endless games out there. They're simulating physics. Physics is part of their games. And video games developers don't write those physics from scratch. Most of the time, they're using already existing libraries, always existing code known as middleware. This basically are li libraries written by experts with document and everything, with multi-platform support. And they've got excellent performance, and they're as realistic as possible. Basically, it's just physics. So for instance, if in a video game, an object falls to the ground, and hits the ground and jumps around, et cetera, et cetera. Just the physics stuff is done, for instance, by Havoc, by Fezex, by DMM. So basically those logos that you see outside of a game is most likely a library that this game is using. Fezex, for instance, by NVIDIA, you see that a lot in games, Havoc or DMM. So that's great. So we can think, why rewrite our own physics engine? Why? think about stuff that are a bit more advanced why not use existing stuff that is out there that is as realistic as possible just to create physics stuff that's great why not use that for crowd simulation but then the next problem is as well uh this this little equation in helping is a bit tricky because that means if you've got a crowd let's even assume 
let's even assume we've got a small crowd of 10 individuals. So that means one person has to look at each other nine individuals and then do some calculations. But then the second person has to do the same thing with each other individual. So basically, we've got to think each individual has got to do 10 calculations. And we've got those to do those 10 calculations for those 10 individuals. Basically, it would be it would be uh, exponential. And actually, that increases the more crowds that we've got. Let's suppose we've got a crowd of 500. So that means each individual has got to do calculations with each other 499 people. And we've got to do that for each 500 people in the crowd. That's actually quite bad in terms of bottleneck. What we get is a very, very bad algorithm that is horrible because the more people that we have, the more requirements in terms of performance that we need, execution time, either memory or disk. And that's actually quite bad. We don't want that. We want to find an algorithm for crowd simulation that doesn't use much performance at all. Because we don't want to be stuck up here where it's actually quite horrible and bad. And that is a problem with this. Because if we've got the, the larger the crowd, the more calculations we need to do. Just looking at the chat, please skip this as a future slide. How can we statistically otherwise measure the difference between a crowd simulation and real scenario? I do have a couple of slides about that. Don't worry. That comes for verification and validation. Anyway, back to performance. So the idea is the problem is here. Bottleneck is here. Cal doing calculation with lots of individuals. How can we make this smaller? The solutions in the existing video games. The idea in video games is, especially with large world environment, is to put the intelligence in the data and not within a complex model. Because having social force model, that thing here with calculating the force of each other individual as I said, is complex and very demanding. Let's go have a look at existing video games. So we've got games like Pokemon or Call of Duty. Call of Duty, that's Company of Heroes, Oliver, not Call of Duty. Uh, what they do, they tend to subdivide the world into a grid. So Pokemon games do that. They just take the world, and it's, the entire world is subdivided into cells. And it's an industry standard. And that's quite good because we can then say each cell has got a particular set of information within that cell. And Pokemon would be, oh, this particular cell is a bush, poof. This particular cell is a wall. The player cannot walk into that cell. And that is good because we've got a layer of cells that has got in different information spread through each cell. Then we can add another layer on top that says, oh, that's where the different uh, Pokemons are. Works fantastic. So the idea is to have AI not part of the character, but AI spread throughout the world. And not only games like Pokemon do that, a lot of games in 3D do that as well. I'm thinking of Halo. Yes, Halo uses a grid on top of the 3D world to say where the different characters are. Company of Heroes, a lot of RTS games do that. A checkerboard pattern overlaid on top of the game. And each cell has got different information. This one, the red cell shows the different areas that the different units cannot go through. Fantastic. And that approach, I'm going to explain a bit more in detail. Let's take, since we talk about Pokemon, I've got Charmander, a couple of Snivies. So you take the entire game world in X and Y, and you subdivide it into cells. So I've got here cell 1-1 one, one, up to cell 8-8. Eight, eight. And uh, what we've got more information, S1 would be in cell 2-2. Two, two. Uh, Snivy 2 would be in cell 4, 3, Snivy 3 in 6, 2, Charmander would be in 5, 6, makes sense. And we have also got another layer uh, on 4, 4, 5, 4, 5, 5, basically those are walls. That's great. We've got some kind of way to display the information within the memory. How can we use that to make the algorithm more performant? Then we can just say Charmander here would like to know what the neighbors are. Because actually, that's what the most important are. We don't care about the snipers that are far away. Perhaps they may affect the behavior of this Charmander, but the force would be so minimum that it can just be ignored. So the idea would be that we're just checking the neighboring cells. And actually, the neighboring cells just values between minus 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, basically everything around it. And that is called the more neighborhood, if you want to look up. And basically, all the neighbors of C, we can actually list them 
quite neatly within a simple uh, table. And we just know the only neighbor that is important is 5-5, five, five, which is this cell, which is a wall. So if we're thinking about a crowd, this Charmander, the force that will affect the behavior of this Charmander, the only one that is important is the wall. We don't care about anything else. Even though we're in a crowd, they're too far, we don't care. That's great. And that idea, we can use it onto each other individual of the crowd as well. Because if we take this uh, Snivy, we can also look at all the neighbors of this Snivy. There's none. That's great. Let's, let's change the scenario slightly. So let's move the Snivies around and let's have a look at each neighbor of this Charmander again. So the only one that would be important are everything that are within a neighborhood of one, so everything around here. And what we've got is again the wall at 5.5, five, this particular wall, then we've got S2 down here and S3. That's great, so that means as part of an algorithm, we only need to care about those three objects. We don't need to care about this particular one. Great. We reduce the algorithm in the search space quite a lot. And of course, we can do that for each other individual and not only for this particular uh, Charmander. So, for instance, if we take Snivy 3, we can find out the neighbors of Snivy 3 is wall, wall, C. Great. Of course, here I'm searching only with a depth of one but we can increase that depth as well if we want to. We can even say, take all the neighbors of a depth of two, so that would not only be all the neighbors around it at cell one, but also all the cell plus one. So in that case, it would take into account this particular wall, four, four, and this particular Snivy. We can expand that or reduce that depending on how performant we want our algorithm. So actually we're reducing the search space, fantastic. However, though, we're not also limited to the size of the cell, because in the previous example, I only put one character per cell. We can have those cells as big as possible and still use the same method on top of that. For instance, we can have uh, split the entire world into larger cells and just have multiple characters as part of the same cell and still do the same approach on top of it. So for instance, we can ask ourselves cell three, three, I'd like to know all my neighbors, so it will return S2, S3, and the wall as well. And of course, we can have different layers of different sizes. We can have everything as one, so we can say part of the world, give me all the information, give me half of the world's information, even make the cell smaller and smaller and smaller. A lot of video games do that. It's great to split information. And as Worm said, that's actually used in a lot of video games and D&Ds as well. It's good to find out how big something is in terms of, for instance, a fireball or an ability. That's great. And I've implemented that as part of uh, a crowd simulation. So I took the helping social force model and started simulating it. And I used my grid model. I didn't focus on graphics. So I'm using simple Minecraft-esque graphics. And I used uh, physics for simulation of the physics. And I'm using helping social force model. And I was able to create characters on screen that behave like a realistic crowd. There's a lot of bumping, but actually in a real crowd that happens as well, especially in airports where people are starting pushing each other out of the way because they're, they're trying to get to the security gate as quickly as possible. I've got those videos on uh, YouTube. If you search crowd simulation, University of Lincoln, you can find those videos quite neatly. Also, I was playing a lot of Minecraft back then when I created those characters, and I didn't want to focus on rendering or generation. So it worked. I can generate crowds. But, of course, there's a, there's a, even though it looks realistic, it's not as realistic as it should be. Because crowds are not composed out of individuals. They're made out of groups of individuals. Groups who have got social ties with each other, people like families, friends, so people who care about each other and they walk in a crowd, either in a pair or trio, et cetera, et cetera. And those coordination, the communication and the structures have an impact on the flow of crowds. So people try to change their position within a group to talk to each other, or perhaps they don't like a person within a group, so they're walking away from a person within that group. And that's changes all the time. Same for evacuations. 
on the, in an evacuation, uh, it's never a perfect evacuation. That people hear the alarm, stand up, walk outside. No, people stand up. Then they go to their friends. Then they create small groups and then they evacuate. And that affects the evacuation time. So you have to think not only part large crowd, but also smaller groups. And we can think of a small example that you've got different groups that each individual has got social tie with each other. So group A, number NPC one likes NPC two, consider themselves part of the same group, still has got tie with this NPC, which also considers themselves as part of a different group. So we've got two groups of small individ of individuals, sorry, but they still consider as part of a larger group. However, the group A may not like individuals within group B, so they're trying pe to avoid people within group B. However, the people within group B like people within group C and they're trying to walk towards them. So plenty of stuff happening and that's only with 10 characters. However, the helping social force model is not looking at uh, groups, which is, a bit, which is bad actually. If we go back to the video of my crowd simulation, each individual is walking on their own. You may see groups, but that just happens to be people walking next to each other. We don't want that. We want people with social ties with each other. We're walking as part of a family, as part of friends, and we need to simulate that. What I'm saying is let's take Halbing social force model and let's add a force called social group. I'm not gonna go into details of that. Basically, I'm saying that uh, people who consider themselves as part of a group try to stick together. And I implemented that as well. And I created a small video. Let's have a peek at it. And that is the same thing as earlier, but now I've got groups of individuals. So now people are trying to walk next to each other as much as possible if they have social tie with each other. Uh, so that would be the crowd simulation with without groups. So individuals are walking on their own. You can see the occasional people walking as part of a group, but that just happens to be two individuals walking next to each other. And then I've got the result with social groups. So basically I'm forcing people next to walk in small groups. Like here we've got a couple of two people. Here we've got two people. No, actually I thought that was a group. Here we've got a large group of six. Actually, to make things a bit easier, I'm drawing now the lines between individuals who consider themselves as part of a group. So for instance, uh, we've got a group here of uh, five individuals and they're trying to stay together, but one individual's, yep. So actually that changed the behavior just slightly, not much, but it's actually more realistic to have groups within those crowds. That affects behavior a lot. Affects not visual a lot, but actually affects it in the long term quite a lot. But the question is still, and Warm actually asked earlier in the chat, how do we say those crowds are realistic? Because here we just looked at a crowd, at a video of a crowd, and we say, yeah, that looks all right. But we need to find data, and we need to make sure that the crowd that we're simulating is as realistic as possible as based on scientific foundation. So we need to get data out of my, out of the crowd simulator and say that data corresponds to a real crowd. How do we do that? So there's lots of stuff, lot of data that we can get out of a crowd simulation or real crowd. Stuff like crowd density, flow rates, bottlenecks, individual velocity, trajectories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the approaches that has been used, one of the approaches, one of the data that has been gathered out of real crowds is something called a fundamental diagram. Fundamental diagram, I've got one here. So on one axis, I've got the velocity in meter per second of individuals. And here we've got the density. So basically how many individuals are per meter square. That's like what it's saying. If we've got one person per meter square, a person is actually walking quite fast, one point up to 1.2 meter per second. However, though, as the meter square becomes more and more dense, even just with two individuals, the velocity gets slower. And the uh, more crowded a meter square gets, like five people per meter square, people walk automatically slower. It's just normal human behavior. If we spot an environment that is crowded, or if we consider ourselves in a crowded environment, we walk slower. As simple as that. And that is normal. We see that everywhere. I mentioned the example of trains in Lincoln earlier. 
as in uh, people waiting at the train crossing. People walk slower. It's just a crowded environment. People walk slower. Um, uh, Christmas market at in Lincoln. Dense environment. People walk slower. It's just normal human behavior. However, there are, we can quantify that quite easily. And uh, that would be an example of a real scenario in Mecca, the pilgrimage in Mecca. And they measured density of individuals and they created a fundamental diagram. And it also follows the same trend. Less dense area, people walking faster, the more dense the area gets, people automatically walk slower. And there's different curves on that because the fundamental diagram is not always a fixed curve. It depends on, uh, of course, the environment. It depends on cultures as well. Interestingly, in uh, Western culture, that curve is usually a bit higher that people even in dense area walk slightly faster. Whereas if we go towards the other side of the globe, the more dense an area, the slower people get. It's interesting, it's always, it's, it's a curve like that. I did not know that either when I discovered this, Evelyn. And I find this in, quite interesting. And uh, yeah, fundamental diagram, you can look it up, I gave a couple of references. And we can do that as part of a crowd simulation as well. So the idea is we create a scenario, a hallway scenario that goes in circles. And we are, and we just create individuals that enter that circle and then we walk around in circles and circles and circles. And then we take an area where we measure the velocity and where we measure the, den where we measure the density. And we run that experiment a handful of times. And if it follows, the results that we get in terms of velocity and density, if it follows the same trend as the fundamental diagram from a real crowd, that means it's great. Our crowd simulation behaves realistically. If it doesn't follow the same trend, that means we've got a problem with our simulation somewhere. So for instance, if we take here a crowded environment, if the speed doesn't go down, as in uh, the velocity of each individual, that means We've got something wrong somewhere. However, there are people who listen to the talk of groups about 15 minutes ago and still recall are gonna say, hey, Oliver, how do we measure groups though using a fundamental diagram? That's a tricky question because fundamental diagram doesn't look at groups at all. It doesn't say, hey, this crowd behaves realistically because uh, we've got groups. No, it behaves realistically because it follows the fundamental diagram. And that's still an ongoing challenge. However, though, in computer vision, we do have ways to identify from a video automatically crowds that you can say, hey, there's a video of people and it automatically detects there's a person, there's a person, there's a person, there's a person, there's a person. There's a person and it can detect the movement of those individuals over a particular area. So for instance, here we've got 15 or 14 people and video AI can automatically identify the trajectories of those individuals. So it can identify this person as this frame here at the start, and then towards the end, it will be around here. So we can find the trajectories of individuals. And what some scientists said is using the trajectories of those individuals in a video, we can detect small groups. Basically it's just saying people while well, being observed to walk next to each other for a long amount of time can be assumed to be part of the same group. Makes sense. Because if you are in a real crowd and you're walking next to another person, well, basically you, you tend to know that person, you tend to socialize and talk with that person. You won't walk next to a random person that you don't know really, really closely for a long amount of time. That would be very, very weird. So basically you can create diagrams like those you can look at, uh, for instance, let's take person one and person 14, it says the probability of those two people walking next to each other is zero. Whereas person, person 14 is over here, they're walking in different direction. So it makes sense, those two individuals cannot be considered as part of the same group. However, let's take person seven, that value is orange, that means person seven, eight and six the value is higher, so that means there's a good chance that those individuals are part of the same group because they're walking next to each other for a long amount of time. So basically trajectory information is enough to find groups in crowds. So I thought if it works for videos of crowds, does it work for crowd simulation as well? If we take the crowd simulation that I developed and use the same approach, 
can we get data out of it that looks like this? And the response is simple, it's yes. So what I'm doing is basically I'm using the social group approach from helping. I'm creating a crowd with groups. Basically, I'm saying if we've got 50 individuals, that would be a standard a normal distribution that you've got low amount of people, group of five. Most of the crowd is working in groups of two, small amount of three. And then I simulate. And that's great because I'm simulating the individuals, individuals, and then I'm applying that video analysis, but just using data from our crowd simulation. So let's suppose I've got here individuals who spawn together, and then they start walking in groups whilst avoiding other people in groups. So basically, uh, let's suppose five and three have got social ties with each other, so they're trying to avoid other groups, but still walk next to each other for communications, for instance. And just by looking at the trajectories, we can get a lot of information out of this. So five and three, let's look at this pair, five, and three, the brighter the color, the better the chance is that they're walking as part of a group, that they've got social ties with each other. Same for eight, four, and two. Eight has got strong ties with four, strong ties with two, strong ties with uh, eight, of course, with itself. However, though, you see six and seven, eight and six. See, the color is a bit darker, so that means the algorithm is not so sure they're part of the same group. Could be that it is part of the same group of five ind individuals, but it's just subsplit into a group of three and two. And one at the start was walking next to other individuals, however, though, it's walking clearly on its own. And that's great because then I can get that information out of the crowd and then I can feed it back into my helping social formula and say, hey, is that the result that I want? If not, let's tweak the values of helping, making perhaps group avoid other groups more or people who have got social ties with each other clump more together. And I can repeat that process over and over again with AI. So basically use the output of the crowd, feed it back, change the value slightly, find out where I've got problems, where I've got things that work well, things that work well, keep them, make them better, things that work bad, let's remove it. Let's run the crowd simulation again. Let's get the data from it and rerun over and over and over again. And that works. So I can get a lot of interesting data out of it to find out if a crowd is realistic, if a crowd simulation, so if a crowd simulation is realistic using fundamental diagram, and I can get information out of it looking at groups. Plenty of ways to do that. And slowly, we're heading towards 10.2 and we're heading towards the conclusions. So what have I talked about for the last 15 minutes? I looked at crowd simulation in general. I looked at the problems that exist, the importance of crowd simulation, where it can be used, where it's still being used in architecture, video games. I looked at video games a lot. I looked at um, games development, games technique that are out there that can be used for crowd simulation. I looked at AI stuff. I looked at ways how to create environment that are large, that are populated with endless people, or looked at the problems of rendering, of behavior, of creating unique individual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of stuff, but I mostly talked about behavior, about verification and validation. However, I still say there's no perfect solution out there. Fundamental diagram, a lot of people discuss, uh, it's not the best way to do it. It doesn't look at groups. However, though, there's a lot of work being done nowadays looking at fundamental diagram of groups. And now with AI getting better and better and better and automatic detection and video analysis getting better as well, we're getting more data out of crowds, of real crowds. And that data, we can reuse that data in crowd simulation. That is great. Lots of stuff out there. So what we've done is basically looked at crowd AI. And hopefully, throughout the talk, I helped you guys to discover crowd simulation, crowd AI, crowd stuff, and uh, starting to look at individuals within any simulation that you see on a computer in a different way, or even help you find passion. Perhaps go out there, read papers about crowd simulation, look at the videos that are online. You just go on YouTube. There's endless crowd simulation videos that AI can be used for crowds quite well. And uh, 15 minutes have passed. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'll stay on here if you've got a couple of questions. I'll answer as much as possible. If you don't have any questions or are unsure about asking me now in the chat or live, 
I've got my email on the screen. Feel free to ping me a question. I'm very happy to answer as many questions as possible. So otherwise, that's it. Thank you very much, guys. And I'll see you around. Thank you for watching. I'll stay on the chat.